I have known him to take out three thousand dollars in two hours and go and pay up every cent of his indebtedness then enter on a then enter on a dazzling spree that finished the last of his treasure before the night was gone and the next day he bought his groceries on credit as usual <laughs> and shouldered his pan and shovel and went off to the hills hunting pockets again happy and content this is the most fascinating of all the different kinds of mining and furnishes a very handsome percentage of victims to the lunatic asylum. Pocket hunting is an ingenious process. You take a spadeful of earth from the hillside and put it in a large tin pan and dissolve and wash it gradually away till nothing is left but a teaspoonful of fine sediment. Whatever gold was in that earth has remained because being the heaviest it has sought the bottom. Among the sediment you will find half a dozen yellow particles no larger than pie head, pin, <laughs> no larger than pin heads. You are delighted. You move off to one side and wash another pan. If you find gold again, you move to one side further and wash a third pan. If you find no gold this time, you are delighted again because you know you are on the right scent. You lay an imaginary plan shaped like a fan with its handle up the hill for rich deposits lie hidden whose vagrant grains of gold have escaped and been washed down the hill, spreading farther and farther apart as they wandered. And so you proceed up the hill, washing the earth and narrowing your lines every time the absence of gold in the pan shows that you are outside the spread of the fan. And at last, 20 yards up the hill, your lines have converged to a point. A single foot from that point, that point you cannot find any gold. Your breath comes short and quick. You are feverish and with excitement. The dinner bell may ring, it's clapper off. You pay no attention. Friends may die. Weddings transpire. Houses burn down. They are nothing to you. You sweat and dig and delve with a frantic interest. And all at once you strike it. Up comes a spade full of earth and quartz that is all lovely with, so with solid lumps with soiled lumps and leaves and sprays of gold. Sometimes that one spadeful is all $500. Sometimes the nest contains $10,000. And it takes you three or four days to get it all out. The pocket miners tell of one nest that yielded $60,000 and two men exhausted it in two weeks and then sold the ground for $10,000 to a party who never got $300 out of it afterward. Okay. The hogs are good pocket hunters. All the summer they root around the bushes and turn up a thousand little piles of dirt. And then the miners long for the rains, for the rains beat upon these little piles and wash them down and expose the gold, possibly right over a pocket. Two pockets were found in this way by the same man in one day. One had $5,000 in it and the other $8,000. That man could appreciate it, for he hadn't had a cent for about a year. In Tuolumne lived two miners who used to go to the neighboring village in the afternoon and return every night with household supplies. Part of the distance they tra traversed a trail and nearly always sat down to rest on a great boulder that lay beside the path. In the course of 13 years, they had worn that boulder tolerably smooth, sitting on it. By and by, two vagrant Mexicans came along and occupied the seat. They began to amuse themselves by chipping off flakes from the boulder with a sledgehammer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they examined one of these flakes and found it rich with gold. The boulder paid them $800 afterward. But the aggravating circumstance was that these greasers knew that there must be more gold where that boulder came from. And so they went panning up the hill and found what was probably the richest pocket that region has yet produced. It took three months to exhaust it, and it yielded $120,000. The two American miners who used to sit on the boulder are poor yet, and they take turn about, it, about in getting up early in the morning to curse those Mexicans. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to pure ornamental cursing, the Native American is gifted above the terms of men.
I have dwelt at some length upon this matter of pocket mining because it is a subject that is seldom referred to in print, and therefore I judge that it would have for the reader that interest which naturally attaches to novelty. Chapter 61 Dick Baker and His Cat Tom Quartz's Peculiarities On an Excursion Appearance on His Return A Prejudiced Cat <laughs> Empty <laughs> <laughs> empty pockets and a roving life. One of my comrades there, another of those victims of 18 years of unrequited toil and blighted hopes, was one of the gentlest spirits that ever bore its patient cross in a weary exile. Grave and simple Dick Baker, pocket miner of Dead House Gulch. He was 46, gray as a rat, Earnest, thoughtful, slenderly educated, sloshily dressed, and clay-soiled, but his heart was finer metal than any gold his shovel ever brought to light, than any, indeed, that ever was mined or minted. Whenever he was out of luck and a little downhearted, he would fall to mourning over the loss of a wonderful cat he used to own. For where wom women and children are not, men of kindly impulses take up with pets, for they must love something. Mm. And he always spoke of the strange sagacity of that cat with the air of a man who believed in his secret heart that there was something human about it, maybe even supernatural. I heard him talking about this animal once. He said, Gentlemen, I used to have a cat here by the name of Tom Quartz which you'd have took an interest in, I reckon. Most anybody would. I had him here eight year, and he was the remarkablest cat I ever see. He was a large gray one of the Tom species, and he had more hard, natural sense than any man in this camp. In a power of dignity, he wouldn't let the governor of California be familiar with him. He never catched a rat in his life. <laughs> appeared to be above it. He never cared for nothing but mining. He knowed more about mining that cat did than any man I ever, ever see. You couldn't tell him nothing about place and diggings. And as for pocket mining, why, he was just born for it. He would dig out after me and Jim when we went over the hills prospecting, and he would trot along behind us for as much as five miles if we went so fur. And he had the best judgment about mining ground, why you never see anything like it. When we went to work, he'd scatter a glance around, and if he didn't think much of the indications, he would give a look as much as to say, Well, I'll have to get you to excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and without another word, he'd heist his nose into the air and shove for home. But if the ground suited him, he would lay low and keep dark till the first pan was washed. And then he would sidle up and take a look, and if there was about six or seven grains of gold, he was satisfied. He didn't want no better prospect than that. And then he would lay down on our coats and snore like a steamboat until we'd struck the pocket, and then get up and superintend. He was nearly lightened on superintending. <laughs> Well, by and by, up comes this year quartz excitement. Everybody was into it. Everybody was picking and blasting instead of shoveling dirt on the hillside. Everybody was putting down a shaft instead of scraping the surface. Nothing would do, Jim, but we must tackle the ledges too, and so we did. We commenced putting down a shaft, and Tom, and Tom Quartz, he began to wonder what in the dickens it was all about. He had never seen any mining like that before, and he was all upset, as you might say, as you may say. He couldn't come to a right understanding of it no way. It was too many for him. He was down on it, too. You, you bet you. He was down on it powerful. <laughs> and always appeared to consider it the cussedest foolishness out. But that cat, you know, was always, again, newfangled arrangements. 
Somehow he never could abide him. You know how it is with old habits. By, but by and by, Tom Quartz began to get over of reconciled a little, or recon <sighs> get sort of reconciled a little, though he never could altogether understand that eternal sinking of a shaft and never panning out anything. At last he got to coming down in the shaft himself to try to cipher it out. And when he'd get the blues and feel kind of scruffy and aggravated and disgusted, knowing as he did that the bills was running up all the time and we weren't making a cent, he would curl up on a gunny sack in the corner and go to sleep. Well, one day when the shaft was down about eight foot, 